All right, as far as what we're doing today, uh, is basically we have CISO review. So I was looking at my notes. This is where we left off around, I think, number 36 in the question bank. So we'll get to the question bank. And I guess we run through that. I was considering maybe just kind of going back through the course as we go through these weeks and getting as many chapters in as we can just to kind of review it all. Because we actually went through the review guide you guys have. I'm going through this one. And then so maybe just refresh your memory you know, as we need to. Going through uh, just the materials again. Are these uh, specific concerns or anything with this course and your studies? OK. All right. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Any questions before we begin? Okay, and I assume you can see my screen, and obviously you hear me. As you can see, it's question number 36. Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. Here we go. All right, we may have actually done this one. We'll just kind of go through it. Because obviously, there's some questions in here that are a bit harder, and some are straightforward. And it's basically defining a, an uninterruptible power supply. Oh, let me tell you how you can do this. You can obviously speak up, but then in, in, in larger groups, it, sometimes it's just nicer if you do the chat window and it comes to, like, telling me ABCD. Obviously, again, you can say what you want to say, but as far as I like to look at the chat window, you can send it to everyone or you can send it just to me, and that way I at least get a gauge that you've had a chance to kind of read it and digest it. Okay. Shove my windows around there. Yeah, and it's a pretty very valuable thing to have. UPS, essentially a big battery, and then if the you know, primary power goes, it kick, kicks in, so we can shut down our systems gracefully and not just suddenly have a database corrupted because it suddenly would have power yanked from it. Okay, Ray ten. And remember, Ray 10, when they put two numbers together like that, they're, they're essentially combining Ray 1 and Ray 0. So what do we see up there? Two numbers. It's just two of them combined. We may remember that Ray 1 was essentially a striping. Uh, well, actually, that was a mirroring. And you had the Ray 0 was like something a gamer would do. So like, if you did Ray 0, you started thinking of striping without the parity, and they thought about the 1. That was more of a mirroring. And remember, rate five was a striping with parity, and rate six was with parity. So when you combine them, you start kind of thinking about it, realizing that the rate zero is the striping and the rate one is the mirroring. Kind of just put them together. Good. So looking at computer owned. Company on computers, which policy spells out their responsibilities and restrictions. Sometimes I look at choices and I go, what will it not be? And take out the not options, and that gets me down to what it sounds more like. It doesn't sound like log management. So really what they're after, you know, it's not really what I'm used to hearing, but I like it the best. Because uh, it didn't sound like incident management, it definitely wasn't log management. They didn't really spell out that they were going to monitor them and how that goes about. It's just, I guess, what they're allowed to do, what your, you know, responsibilities to protect the information. And when you think about maybe you're not allowed, maybe you're in the military environment and you're not allowed to have thumb drives, that could be a restriction.
So passwords for privileged service accounts, such as those performed backup, should be given. I can't see my question. <laughs> given to the following. And really think about it. If anything, if there's a need, it's back to that least privileged need to know. I mean, if you have a requirement, then you should have those permissions. If you don't have the requirement, you don't need those permissions. Methods below would be used to distribute security information that users and managers require to do their job. Good. Security awareness and training program, which seems like every security course overseas seems to bring that one up because it is not something you do one time and you stop, but you, you just kind of keep doing the training over and over again because people, you get new employees, you get people that just don't get it and they need to be reminded. Full disk encryption provides which benefits to workstations. Now we think about full encryption, disk encryption, I, have, I think of things like um, PGP, pretty good privacy as a full disk encryption product. BitLocker is another one. And really, I mean, these are on the disk, you know, the hard disk. So it is controlling the information that's on the hard disk, which is data at rest, because it's not traveling. It's not being transmitted across the network. It's actually just sort of sitting on the hard drive for example. I'm not the prettiest. Okay, when Larry sends Mary a confidential information used in RSA, which is that asymmetric encryption, what key is used to encrypt the message? Remember the asymmetric is a public-private key pair, and uh, you may remember that we keep the private key private, and we traditionally, well, a lot of places would have some sort of repository, some call it a global address list, a gal where they, each person would publish their public key where other people could get to their public keys of the other people, of the other users. Okay. So if Larry's going to send Mary the, well, they can also just say I mean, some sort of encryption, encryption message, confidential message, what is used to encrypt that message. Well, Larry will use something of hers. He, he would not use her private key because he can't get to it. And the theory is if he does the encryption with her public key, then when she receives this, she can use her private key to decrypt it. So it works out real well because in theory, if he does this, Mary's public key being used to initially encrypt it, but then only Mary can decrypt it would be the thinking. So I don't know if any of you have worked in environments like that, but the military is kind of big on this where they, they have a repository and each person publishes their own public key. So it's no problem to go get somebody else's public key and use that. And then knowing that that person can, will have their own private key. I, I basically risk. Defining risk. Okay. Probability that a threat will exploit this vulnerability. I mean, you may have bad guys out there, uh, these threat agents, and you may have systems that have weaknesses, vulnerabilities, but this probability or likelihood tends to be what your overall risk is when you put all that together. You know, just kind of thinking about are there are the people out there going? To, the bad guys going to actually find out that I have the vulnerability and, and punch through that vulnerability, and suddenly I have a higher risk. What device makes sniffing easier?
hackers are actually extremely happy with you know these devices <laughs> because the sniffing was much easier. They were so displeased when uh, then the replacement came out. So effectively, these hubs, these hubs were at the physical layer of the OSI model, and anything at the lower layers of the dumber devices, of course. So the hubs were dumber than the switches. So we had hubs first, and hubs had no way, because they were a physical layer device, of learning the individual MAC addresses, you know, the unique IDs of each computer that was plugged into each port. So the hub, every time information would come in, it would just have to like forward out that information out all the ports because it didn't know where to send it. It was just sort of a constant uh, broadcast of sorts. But when we went to switches, they started being more intelligent, being a data link layer, a layer two device, where they could build a table of what device, what computers plugged into what physical port. And they could make more intelligent decisions, therefore sniffing was harder, actually, with the switches. Mapping a website names to IP address is done by And, you know, it's, it's pretty nice that we can do this. We can go to, you know, Google Chrome or Firefox or something and just type in a friendly name and magic. It seems to work. And that's because of something called DNS. That was, that's kind of the modern way. I mean, there was a long time ago, when we, had, we had a host file. There still is one that has computer names to IPs, but it's just not going to get it these days with so many systems being on the Internet. And the NetBIOS is much older than Microsoft, and the Winds is much older than Microsoft. And not that they, they, they did conversion too, though. Now, as far as what the others are up there, the FTP is File Transfer Protocol. And that's just to transfer. You have an FTP server that holds files. You're able to upload and download. And the DNS definitely does this resolution. The ARP Address Resolution Protocol, I know it sounded highly suspicious. But if you do art-a, for example, you just see it's mapping IPs to MAC addresses. So that may have sounded terribly familiar because you knew it maps something. <laughs> it, yeah, it does map something, IP to MAC address. And it just so happens DNS is a little higher. It does name to IP, but ARP does IP to MAC address. So it kind of works out. And then the DHCP, that's something you kind of reach out and say, I need an IP address, <laughs> and, it was, and it gives you one. Define the term threat. So you're not, you're not think of a threat, I probably think of a bad guy or I think of something bad that person is doing. And it is obviously you know, act, it's an activity they're doing that could be possible danger to my information if they get into it or my operations. So I mean, maybe a person that's causing it, or who knows, it, it might even be uh, a weather event, like not even a person, not even a hacker. Okay, the looking at wireless standards that support data rates. Uh, the actual the number there is wrong, but you could still figure it out if you know what they're, they're doing here. Uh, because it was actually 54, so support so data rates at 54 megabits per second at the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. So in that ballpark is what we're looking at. Okay, close enough for our needs. <laughs> so, because really the B standard was 11. And then G jumped up to like 54. And A was doing 54 the whole time, but it was doing 5 gigahertz, not 2.4. Most everything did the 2.4, except this A standard. The I wasn't really in the same realm. The I was just more of a security thing. We started looking at like WPA2 and AES encryption. So that's the way I remember, I go, in the beginning it was bad, it was only 11 megabits, and then it was good, because it was faster, <laughs> 54, but they were still living in the 2.4 world. Now the A standard, I'm not sure where people were using that, because when I talk to people, I generally don't get anybody to say, oh, I use the A standard. It's just so super rare. With the OSI model, 
which transport layer protocol is used to guarantee the proper delivery of an application data. So you've got to kind of visualize the OSI model. And remember the protocols at the transport layer. And then of those, which ones are guaranteed to give you proper delivery. So essentially, TCP and UDP were the only two at the transport layer. And then when you think about more of the guaranteed delivery, it was TCP because it has that three-way handshake and has a lot of reliability in it. The UDP is like, I've heard it compared to as a postcard. I hope you get it. It's kind of a, we hope it worked out kind of thing. Okay. All right. What Internet Explorer browser feature allows a hacker to view hidden form fields? called view source. Good. What can we use as a countermeasure dealing with rogue wireless wireless uh, SSB access point access points being added to the company network? Rogue just means somebody decided to add their own like wireless access point to your network and, we're, and they're not supposed to be there. So we're trying to figure out something that might keep their access point from being successful with our users and everything, interacting with our world. Now the MAC address filters, that just restricts what PCs can get on a particular access point. So if somebody decides to create a new access point and not put the restrictions, then our people wouldn't be restricted on that new access point. Now, if we weren't worried about rogue devices, then I like the filtering. That's nice. I also like the disable in the SSID, because that's kind of nice, too, as far as not being seen. But that won't help us with dealing with rogue access points, unfortunately. So what they're thinking is there's something called 802.1x, and it just seems like... I did a Security Plus recently, and it was just kind of funny because I told him, well, 802.1x is probably not always the answer when it's secure wireless. It seems like it is because the 802.1x is a port-based authentication, which you can tie into doing something called a radius server. So you can actually authenticate the people, not just the encryption, but the authentication. So if we, we have some sort of required authentication to connect into our corporate network, and we do the 802.1x, the rogue device won't be configured to do, do what we need, to, what we require, so those people wouldn't be able to get on our network. So a lot of times 802.1x is associated with adding authentication, which makes us more secure. The company's mission statement should relate to its security policy in what way? Helps align security activities with the needs of the business. And you really think about a company's mission statement. I mean, it's kind of telling you their goals and, and what they're trying to accomplish. And of course, our emphasis here is on security. And we just want to make sure that what we do is trying to fulfill what the company's mission statement is trying to accomplish. Because it's about the company. It's not about our computer department. Uh, we're, we're to make the company successful. Dealing with the company's overall security program, oh, there we go, who should be completely supportive in the security process. I know, they've always got us trained to mess up on this one. 
I mean, we know senior management is critical, absolutely. I guess the question is, does it go beyond senior management? So we're talking about the company's overall security program who should be completely supportive to really make it work super well. Is it just senior management? Is it just the finance department and CIOs? Or just the CIOs and senior management? Or is it everyone? So it's almost like a trick question, I know, from CISO. Is this, you're, just, you're just trained. You've got to have senior management on board. They're, if they're not with you, it's not going to succeed. <laughs> but, you know, ideally for the overall security, if we don't have everybody supportive, then some of those other people can mess things up. Employees generally have different areas of expertise or skills. So what is the recommended, what is the recommended especially with technical staff? Okay. Organizations should ensure employees have overlapping skills for all job, job functions. That would be really good. <laughs> I think because we don't want to just have a single dependency and say, well, Bob there, the great administrator, he knows everything, and none of us have a clue, because it really would be a mess if Bob suddenly won the lottery and took off on us. So, you know, we need to make sure we people know how to do some of the other functions. They may not do it as well, but at least they have some overlapping skill base. What is access creep? You know, I get the impression this happens a lot, unfortunately. And, um, you know, the idea is you, you were put in a particular job function and you had those privileges and then they moved you to another job function or department and you gained new privileges and then maybe you got moved again and you gained new privileges. But yet you're no longer in those original job roles so you really no longer require the access, but yet a lot of times people think, don't think to go remove the old access. They just kind of make sure you've got the new things you need. So you have too many privileges as a result. What is the best way to inform employees about the security risk inherent to internet use in the workplace? So we want to inform employees about the security risk inherent to internet use in our workplace. So basically pushing the same concept, keep that user awareness training up. You don't go, well, I already did it a year ago. Well, do it again and again. <laughs> At least yearly and re refresh these people's memory, you know, they, they may forget, they may be sloppy. Uh, this, we're all about training of the employees because even if you have super good security, you know, as far as the configuration goes, it only takes an employee to mess things up, you know, because they're sort of uh, violating security and just being too loose with it. What type of attack saturates or slows down network communication? Okay, good. Yeah, uh, we call it a denial of service. And, you know, kind of the idea, just like it says, you're just, just doing nothing but pure meanness. I mean, you're just flooding it. You're disrupting them. You're just, like, sending as much traffic as you can their way. Okay. Advantages of wireless networking over wired. OK. 
Okay. More convenient, less expensive. Yeah, you're not sitting there going, do I have all the cables, all the connectors? Do I have all this equipment? I've got to plug everything in. And then it just takes up space and all that. It's just super, it's much easier. Very convenient. I just configure it. So, concerning a strong password policy, what would be recommended from this list? Okay. Let's see. It's one of those elimination ones. Could, I like those. Look at B, for example. Contains at least six characters. I don't know. That's kind of weak. I like to see more than that. And D, it should not be longer than 14. You know, I've heard the military does 15 or better. So I know that's not typical in a commercial world, but I think they've got some good strategy there. Do not allow the reuse of previous passwords for 180 days. That's kind of an odd one. But, you know, making sure people change their passwords fairly regularly, I think that makes a big difference. Concerning the vulnerability scan, what is next? I guess after you do the vulnerability scan. Okay, so what you could imagine is you've run maybe a Retina, GFI Landguard, Nessus, Saint vulnerability scanner. It runs, it comes back with a report. It tells you about what's bad or what's what's a little bit bad, what's really bad. I mean, it kind of rates it. Gives you, and it even gives you ideas of what you can do about it. And so kind of the idea, you have to prioritize the findings that present the highest risk to the company because maybe it comes back and it lists a lot of little things that are wrong. But then there's some that sort of just jump out as being a bigger deal, and those are the ones you would do first. Reliability, define reliability with information security. I know you could argue maybe two of these. Maybe if I'm looking at, uh, I have some data stored on the server. Maybe it has my, my health information. Maybe it has my financial records. And I would like it to be reliable. I want it to have some, you know, something here. So effectively, I want it to have good integrity. I understand the reliability of, of thinking of availability. Yeah, I know. See, it's so strong, isn't it? So reliability of the information security, I guess, kind of, you know, it's not been manipulated falsely by the wrong people, kind of pushes the integrity. That's a really strong one. Uh, availability, if they change the availability, if the system's not there when I need to, I can see that too. So I guess it's um, A is really strong, and I think C is kind of right behind it, the available. Or I think if they worded it different, availability. What is the most difficult attack to discover and stop? And some of these, I think, I know they say discover and stop. Sometimes I'm not so positive that they mean, some of these are kind of like partial. You can at least, ease, maybe it's easy to discover, but not always easy to stop. But something here, I guess, just jumps out as being more difficult to discover and do something with. Okay, this is what they're thinking. Web pages with malicious executable content. And it is tough. Okay, let's see. Offer browser instructor to download malicious information that the user has no knowledge of during the browsing experience. That is a hard one. 
you know, and they've had on the OWASP top 10 uh, web application vulnerabilities and web, you know, dealing with websites and so on. I mean, they keep bringing it up, ones like cross-site scripting, for example, which you could have malicious scripts, which is malicious executable content that could be there. You know, when it comes to viruses, I mean, if we have a good antivirus, it should be able to dig into it and see that. You know, first of all, I know a lot of the more secure places, if you even have an executable, it's going to do something about it. It's, gonna, it's not going to let it go through. So that wouldn't happen. Let's see. Exploits against web applications such as SQL injection buffer overflow. That's a that's a bad one too. But there are preventative measures that you could you could work with. And, you know, a lot of input validation probably. Distributed denial of service attacks, maybe not as easy to stop, but definitely easy to notice. I think these these are the web page with malicious content, executable content is not always so discoverable. Define business impact analysis document. When you think about doing a BIA, business impact analysis, and what you would put in this document that you put together, if you've done this analysis and everything, you know, and I kind of think that's the big sell to management all putting together a good business continuity disaster recovery planning, you know, plan, <laughs> is the fact that you kind of spell out, hey, if this happens, look what it's going to do to us, it's going to do us in, or this other thing happens, it could be just you know, irreparable damage. You know, we need to do something so we're more prepared. <laughs> so it's almost like the scare tactic in my, my thinking that convinces them to spend money to be safer and more protected against possible disruptive events. And a software development project, which of the fallen should approve it? And you may have noticed in this course that there is a big push for this. I know, I know you may have heard the steering committee, but you definitely heard the change control board or something similar, or change management committee of some sort. You know, the whole idea is everything has to go through an approval process. And, you know, there may be some, you know, new software being developed, some new code, um, you know, some changes. Everything needs to go through an approval process and make sure that it's okay to implement. To speed up develop, deploying patches in large environments, what do we do? Yeah. Centralized patch management application. We can't depend on patching on a per computer basis. We would have something centralized. It would, would be aware of what patches were successfully pushed and uh, which ones were not. Okay. Uh, which systems did not get their proper patching. If a user loses their handheld device, what software application could protect the data on the device? So they've lost their handheld device. Protect their data. Okay. And you may, your minds may have slipped into specifics that you could do to protect that device, and you may be thinking, well, I'm going to remotely wipe that device because they lost it. If I remotely wipe it, then it's all okay. Well, there's your centralized management software to the rescue, and I guess that, that's kind of the idea. We're not worried about syncing our data, <laughs> and we're not the anti-malware. I mean, this should have already been on there. <laughs> You know, so it's more being able to reach out and do something with that device, such as remotely wipe it. Before running a host vulnerability scan, do which of the following? In other words, before you pull out 
Saint or Nessus or Retina or any of those vulnerability scan programs, before you do any of that and start involving different computers, what this must be done first. You just don't take off on your own little vulnerability assessment. You may think you're doing really good, but it won't be looked at that way. Okay, so we always get permission first. And the facts are that when you run a vulnerability scan, sometimes it tends to be a little aggressive, and you could potentially mess some mach machines up, reboot some machines, interfere with productivity, and we don't want to just start doing that because we think it's a good thing and not have permission for management. Define steganography. Now you may remember steganography was actually you could take a graphic or a sound file or some sort of media and hide something else within it. The, the interesting thing is usually you don't even know, you don't really, unless you have tools that will detect it, it's not really that noticeable, if at all noticeable. And the neat, other neat thing is you're not using any encryption. Steganography does not encrypt at all. It's just simply hiding something like text, a hidden message inside of a graphic, for example. So when you think of it that way, it may be a characteristic we weren't aware of, that the file size remains the same, but if you were to hash the, you know, hash the original and then hash it again later, if it's been, something that's been inserted through steganography, the hash file values would be different because there is something different about it. The actual file size, funny enough, remains the same. And even if we didn't know that, we could maybe get to that point. The message is encrypted. Stego does not encrypt. Music files are distorted and quality is noticeably impacted. Generally, it's not noticeable. See, amount of data that can be transmitted is very small. I don't buy that. <laughs> so you just kind of land on it eventually. A software development program with a security emphasis should. So we're developing a new software program, and we want to think really about security. So when we think about that development, what goes through our mind? So as we go through this, we know in this, you know, in this day and age and everything, that any software we put out there, somebody's going to try to attack it. Someone's going to try to do different strategies to break through it, because maybe it's a database we're making or a web application. They're going, we need to anticipate what the bad guys might try to do. So we think about security. The user convenience to me usually goes away from security. <laughs> the detailed error messages where most security books tell you not to do that because the detailed error messages give more information out to the hacker than we ever wanted them to know. It's pretty amazing. So think about what the, the, it's probably going to be hacked. People are going to try to break it and try to prepare yourself for you know prevention as much as possible from letting them succeed. Weakness in systems that could be attacked. So you look at the you know the weakness in the system that could potentially be attacked by somebody, and it has a name. This weakness. We call it a vulnerability. Okay. That's why we're always patching. Now we're talking databases. I don't like the way this is completely worded, but it's the closest one. Okay. Define foreign key. You just think well, how we use a foreign key in general. What do you what's the purpose?
So yeah, I mean, that's one way of wording. It's not her, my favorite wording, but I know that the foreign key references the primary key. I would agree with that. I guess potentially in another database, or maybe it's in the same database, but the main thing is it references the primary key. So you know, you might have one table in a database that uses, you know, is based off of employee ID as the primary key, but then there's a another key in there that might be product ID, and that's it's not really a primary key in the first table, but product ID might be the, the primary key in another table, and you can link them together by the foreign one referencing the primary in the first table. Dealing with disaster recovery for locations that are not mission critical and allow some time of recovery, what would we use? Not mission critical. And yet we're get, we have some time. Okay, so it's a little cooler. It's it's warm. Uh, nothing about mobile. If it were more critical and we were time was of the essence, I think we might start looking at. They'd have to give us more detail. Maybe hot site if it was you know was mission critical, but then mirrored site would be faster. But then giving you some time though. Oh, you have a warm site. You have a location to go to that has some peripheral equipment that it really isn't set up with computers to speak of. So it's going to take some time. This is continuity plan that steps through a simulated disaster process is. Good. As you're stepping through a simulated disaster process, it's not any sort of desk check, and you're not parallel with sounded more like doing operations at your main location and alternate location simultaneously. In a full interruption, there would be no simulated to it in a way. I mean, you basically have just cut operations at one and, and tried to see if they will move to the other location. The tabletop walkthrough, whatever you'd like to call it, does this. Method to evaluate the security of new software. There was a chapter we went through that had the TCSEC, the ITSEC, and we finally finalized to the common criteria. And it, they have a rating system. And if I just remind you of this, spell it right. Let's see if I do EAL ratings. You'll probably know what I'm talking about. Here's common criteria. Here's certified products for the common criteria portal have different products and then give them ratings, have operating systems. See Microsoft Windows 8 and Windows RT. There's things around here. Okay, they're not giving quite as high a thing here. But anyway, look at this. You got EAL 4.2.2 two plus, four plus, and so on, and we don't have to worry about the details there, but the main thing is it's a rating system. You can get rated if you sit there and just did a, a quick search and you said something like Windows 7. Then they'll probably come back with some little, you know, Wikipedia article or some little chit chat about their certification, and, you know, the, the big vendors tend to do that, okay? Yeah, these are going to be harder. Um, probably five. I'm going to have to bring that up. I don't think that's just going to come to you. Let's see. Okay. 
your probably favorite chapter of the whole book, huh? Let's see. Well, they're, they're going through this and you see in the FTC sec, the IT sec, and then they finally land on the common criteria. And this screen here, protection profile, is a description of the needed security solution, real world need, by the way. Uh, this particular slide in your book in Chapter 5, which looks like it's 36 slides or so into it, so it might translate into roughly 36 pages into your chapter, toward the end, uh, they'll have the definitions as it, you know, when it real, deals with this whole common criteria. And we're going to look at it, you know, a few questions right now. They're kind of, maybe just one or so. They're here, they're here and there we run into them. And they may ask you about one of the terms that they use. You can read up on the common criteria. Look at their site. They actually speak to you in these language. They'll say protection PP, protection profile. We saw that with Windows 8 just a moment ago. Target of evaluation, TOE. So the product is proposed to provide the needed security solution. Security target is written by the vendor explaining the security functionality and insurance mechanisms. So the vendor is basically saying this is what our product does and how it does it. And finally, there's a rating system, uh, EAL ratings, and then they, they spell out functional and insurance levels. Okay. So here, when Mary submits her new software product for testing, the operational parameters for her device must be defined, and they want to know what this would be called. It is her new software. So let's look at them again. Here we go. All right. Security target. Sounds like she was the programmer, written by the person, the vendor. It explains their security functionality assurance mechanisms. This is our this is what our product does and how it does it, because I'm the vendor. I'm the software, I'm the one who wrote the software. So I'm submitting my software. So that page in your uh, in chapter five, this is a really good one when you're testing if you need to look anything up. Because you know, chapter five is full of a lot of really odd things, you know, the different software evaluation models, the Viva, the Bell Abadula, and all the different things like that. Okay. A model for system security based on confidentiality and integrity it can be based on what two models? This is also Chapter 5. Okay. Bella Vadula and Biva. Go back here, same chapter. And just remember the Bella Vadula was all about confidentiality. The Biva was all about integrity. So right in there. A define a procedure versus a baseline. So baseline outlines the configuration of the device and procedure lists the steps and actions that must be followed. All right, to ensure better security between two parties with a, an encryption called transport layer security, TLS, and concerns over using the correct public keys for one another, how can each person be sure that they do not that they do have the correct public key? Okay. 
Yeah, when you think about it, you're giving a few things away. If you remember TLS and SSL, both work in the public private key world, the asymmetric world. And with you know certificates, a whole thing. I mean, when you think about TLS, there's a mandatory certificate requirement, just like SSL. So a lot of times, if you're in an environment that was using a public-private key pair with the associated certificate, um, then you know the certificate's really important because they use some very what's on the certificate, which we see that a lot when you think about it, you go to secured web pages and you can click on the gold lock and you can actually see all the details of the certificate and make sure it's a match. The concern with having a secure key exchange process is So, let's see, a concern with having a secure key exchange process is, yeah, they're kind of tricking you uh, somewhat. I mean, you may be thinking of the defense side, and we did hear, you know, some things about getting a secure key exchange with the asymmetric, but they, they did stick that word attack at the end of Diffie Health, and so I have a problem with that. So, you know, we're, I guess the reason we're so obsessed about our key secure key exchange process is we have concerns over man-in-the-middle type attacks, which we're trying to prevent. Okay, a security model developed to prevent the information between two competitors from being discovered is... Okay, I don't know if there's a picture on this one. That chapter five again, security models, if you just kind of go back through that, I'll show you what they're after. There was one called Brewer and Ash Chinese Wall, which is all about fair competition. So making sure that, you know, no, the subject, that's a person, accesses objects. If, they, if you have expressed interest in, uh, let's say there's two companies on that server, you express interest in the one company, then you can't get to the other company. So if you access one company's data, the competitor's data is automatically deemed off limits. So Brewer and Ash is your Chinese wall. Okay. Concerns of employees being convinced to give up information through manipulation has a name. The overall name is called social engineering because they didn't spell out exactly what method they're using. Were they doing their social engineering through email, which is more of phishing? Or maybe it started with the letter V, vishing, for voice. It could be some variation of spear phishing, um, whaling, but they're all social engineering. That's the main thing. And yeah, social engineering may do the name dropping. It's like social engineering is kind of like the, the main term, and these others are just like examples, or well, some of them are examples. A backdoor, a trapdoor, and software, what is that? Okay, so a function embedded in a program that allows the programmer to quickly gain access at a later time. I know we initially may think of a backdoor as always something hacker related, I admit I think that way too, but at the same time, you know, people that do programming will intentionally embed a way to get back in. But the idea is they're supposed to really remove it before it hit production, but you know, that's by definition, that's what they're really trying to accomplish. 
Protect systems from malicious software. Select. You know, we've probably already learned that everything is a layered approach, you know. So they're saying the universe you have needs to be coupled with some other systems that, like, do behavioral-based detection, which, in other words, your universe typically just picks up viruses, mainly picks up viruses that it knows by name based on its signature that you keep updating every time you update the universe, so the signatures of all the different viruses. But then it's always good to have a system that can do some behavioral-based detection in other words, if something is malicious, it acts malicious, but it doesn't actually have a name, because maybe it's a brand new attack, maybe it's a zero-day attack, it will be known later, then the behavioral-based systems will catch that. Maybe it's a rootkit, maybe the antivirus can't do it, so perhaps an anti-rootkit. Um, so something that looks at the traffic to see if there's any sort of web traffic that's malicious. So we kind of look at, I guess, the big picture uh, of solutions all right, we're going to do, let's go ahead and go ahead and take a break, a five-minute break or so. We're going to come back. I think I'm going to stop the questions there. Like I told you, my idea was to, since we're calling this a review, and we're doing a lot of sys reviews, we're just, I think I'll just start back at the beginning of the book and, and swiftly, you know, start kind of going through chapters. And, yes, it's repetitive, but that's a good thing. So uh, any questions before we go on break? Okay, so anyway, just take a like, five-minute break. I will see you soon. So, all right, enjoy your break. Hope everybody is feeling better, all revived. Anyway, so I uh, hope everybody's back. And you can see my screen okay, what I was thinking. We would just kind of start going back through everything, making that a review. So next session we'll go through um, more questions as well as, you know, kind of continuing with this. All right. Like that. All right. Looking at risk management, just kind of going back through that. And hopefully these were some of the simpler chapters we were looking at. And with that, uh, actually, let me hit the button real quick. One second. Okay, so risk management. You know, that's really what we, we think about. I mean, we're, I think we're kind of consumed with that, you know, about risk. So we're looking at information security and we're protecting assets and I know those things that could harm our assets, the threats. And we think about what we can do to maybe uh, put in place what, what countermeasures, what controls we can put in place to make it not so bad when we know that there are threats out there trying to break into our systems. And of course trying to put some sort of control in place again to minimize this. We don't hear the word eliminate risk altogether, but we do hear you know, we're always trying to manage our risk, I and mean, the whole chapter is called risk management, because it really isn't some magic method where you can just like say there are no, we've eliminated everything, there are no problems. So looking at risk definitions and so on, moving through. So you've seen this before, and I'll pick up the pace here. Essentially, you know, you kind of look at this kind of a nifty picture. Remember, safeguard is just another word for like countermeasure or control, because we do have these weaknesses. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what your favorite operating system is.
Okay, Chuck, can you hear me? Yes, Testing. I can. Yes, okay. I can. Okay. okay, I don't know what changed. I push snow buttons. <laughs> Very strange. Okay, I'm gonna. The only button I did when the sound went away is I hit the button of uh, uh, restart recording. I'm gonna try to hit restart recording again and see if I you lose my audio. Okay, do let me know if it goes away. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do a mute of somebody as well. Okay, perfect. All right, so everything, just let me know if I go away. I'll keep watching the chat window and see if anything's changed. Okay. So looking at this, you know, you're going to see this picture before. Yes. And yeah, I'm going to yeah, Let me take care of that one. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm picking up audio from somebody. I'm going to try to take care of that. Okay. All right. So, so basically, we have these weaknesses. You know, it's all the systems get have vulnerabilities, even the Mac systems, even the Linux systems, just a matter of you know, there may be perhaps more with the more popular systems, but still, whatever they are, a threat's a threat, a vulnerability's a vulnerability, we still have all those issues. So we're, we're always really obsessed with reducing our risk to our wonderful, cherished assets, because we don't want to, to lose that, okay? So, you know, you look at the risk definitions, we're essentially going to kind of go in through these. And, you know, it's sometimes really hard to figure out what is an asset truly worth. I mean, you can sit there and think about, well, what did it cost me to get that asset? If I replaced it, that could be a lot of money. You never know. Maybe I had to develop it. Maybe it's just so important to our company. And what would the bad guys pay for it? You know, what does it cost to maintain it? I mean, there's a lot that goes into what is an asset truly worth. Okay. How would you feel if you didn't have that asset? That might be a big one. And then we think about, I call these the bad guys. <laughs> you know, you've got some variations here. I mean, they're going to do threat and threat agent. They're really close. So threat source agent. And a lot of books don't really break this down into like two parts, but effectively they're very similar. So the threat agent source is the entity that can adversely act on the asset. In other words, it could be a bad guy. It doesn't mean necessarily a person. I mean, yeah, it could be a person. It could be somebody inside your company. And it could be something they did intentionally, or it may have been a complete accident. I don't know if I told you guys, I worked at a company, and there was an employee that managed to delete our entire database back in, like, 1994 or something, ages ago, <laughs> maybe even older than that. And my comment was, he's too dumb to know how to do that. And that was just a private comment at the time. And it's like, well, he did it. <laughs> it was accidental, I think. I do think it was accidental. But it was just amazing. But then what if it was intentional? Then, of course, you get the bad guys on the outside, and sometimes they get success whether they be, whether they're skilled or not skilled. And, and you could have threats from something that happens with from natural events. It could be a threat to you. And then, you know, threat agent. And then, of course, the, you think of maybe the threat itself being the adverse action that was performed by the threat agent, whether that be that hacker we're talking about or that software they wrote called a worm that degraded your performance, whether or maybe it's a system administrator took too many privileges, they had the ability to do something and they violated user privacy and they shouldn't have. Or they let somebody listen in on something they shouldn't have. So again, we think about a vulnerability, it's something that's weak. It's a weakness and that could be used against us to exploit something we value, our assets. And it may be because we don't have good secure access control. We have our procedures what procedures, you know, maybe a lack of those, or we don't train people, or we don't patch our systems, or, you know, nobody's really paying attention to the programming code and whether it's full of bugs or not. Okay. And examples of some vulnerabilities not so obvious. I mean, I think a lot of people don't have a clue what security really is. I mean, the use of computers, they go to work, but they're really not that in tune to it. And then what about the people who have too many privileges because we're not following least privilege? Or we don't have say so concentration of responsibilities, maybe we don't have a good separation of duties and we don't have a good plan, we have people to, to do, you know, something happens, what do we do about it, having a plan put together and a team, 
and, and so on. So, you know, you can send people off for mandatory vacations. You know, they might do that in banking to see if someone, you know, basically to audit them and see if they're doing something unethical. Okay. You know, trying to invest some money or something. So we try to put these controls in place. Sometimes we call them controls, countermeasures, safeguards. And we put these things in place. Like if I don't like viruses, I'm probably going to buy an antivirus. And that's going to hopefully reduce my risk to my computer. And you get into my assets, my computers, and everything. So I get, maybe I get a nice firewall. Maybe at work I'm going to use smart cards for people to authenticate with, a card and like a pen code. Maybe I put in place some security guards to watch who comes in. You know, it's all these different controls that we can put in place or countermeasures. And then we start looking at the likelihood. Basically, they're called it likelihood, but effectively, okay, the frequency that a risk scenario could occur. And it might be based, like I heard somebody just recently say they were from Oklahoma, and what went through my brain was tornadoes. I don't know, it just jumped in my mind. Yeah, historical events. There's a lot of tornadoes there, was what I was thinking. So maybe you, you look at it from, well, maybe the, the threat that you're concerned about happens to be tornado action and bad storms that could damage your building. And you might look at the historical events. Maybe it's a hacker and are based on their motivation or skill, you know, and so on. And then about how bad, what, what's it going to do to you, your impact? Magnitude harm of you know magnitude of harm exposure. So you think about the potential loss that you could receive on your asset from something bad happening. You know, and you know if you've been hacked, for example, like Target was, then you know, have the financial. Obviously, you know people may be afraid if they heard you've been hacked to show up and purchase things. As I was, I stayed away for a while, and maybe others did too. Reputation. Maybe we don't have as much faith in a company that has been hacked and it gets out in the open, you know, and so on. So and we might just flee and go to another company. And then, of course, when you think about the controls that you put in place, you want functional evaluation and you want assurance. When you think about functional, you know, proof that the control is working correctly. It's performing its design security function. In other words, if you have a firewall, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Is it blocking and allowing traffic as a firewall would? And then, but there's also a really big thing. You have the control. You bought the control. Maybe it does a fantastic job functionally. But then you ask yourself, was it the right control after all? And that's the assurance. I mean, yes, you bought this beautiful control. It works great, but it doesn't do what we needed it to do because we bought the wrong control. <laughs> that kind of thing. So is it the right type of control to mitigate the identified risks that we have? And if so, is it adequate? So we're always trying to manage risk and put risk to a level that we can tolerate. I mean, if we had unlimited budget, we might say, well, we'll just spend tons of money and no one could hurt us because we'll buy all the best security software and equipment and appliances we could ever imagine. But we're not unlimited in funds. For the most people, that's true. We're not, most people don't have unlimited funds. So we have to reduce a risk to something we can live with based on, I guess, how much money we have and people and so on. Remember, risk cannot be eliminated, but it must be managed. So we can look at doing a risk assessment, and we have to first identify what we value. These are our assets. Then we have to figure out how much they're worth, the value. And then we identify these assets, what vulnerabilities and what the weaknesses they could have vulnerabilities, what threats, what bad guys, you know, or bad things that could harm them. Then we do some calculations. And we think we try to do a lot of estimation of what we could possibly lose if certain things were to happen and and think about likelihood that these, you know, these pretend events could happen. And I try to come up with something we can do about it. So we do want to have a risk response. We don't want it just something to happen and no one have a clue what to do. So we think through hopefully ahead of time, if this were to happen, is there something we could do to make this not hurt us. You know, what about malware? What about worms? Maybe there's something, you know, when we determine the best action to take in response to identified risk, we may say, well, have an antivirus in place. But then we have to look how much it's going to cost for that countermeasure. And, you know, kind of is it going to benefit us? Is it, is it going to cost us so much that it's really not beneficial? 
And with anything, risks do change, and it's, it's a, like a constant thing. It's not a one-time deal. You do risk monitoring. And it might be, you know, I just got lectured earlier today at the doctor <laughs> about, well, you know, since we got all these HIPAA requirements, things are so different now. And they're trying to encourage me to get health records online because if you get an emergency room or something, and you, it's like really a big deal just to get your health records. But if you have online access, you can just get to them. They're like pushing me on that. Because, you know, they're talking about policies, you know, regulations change. You know, things do change, and that was a regulation. So they had to do a response to that and have a good plan. And, of course, you have to flex with those changes, adjust your controls or risk response as needed. I mean, when the HIPAA requirements went through, it made everybody try to go toward a more secure environment, which, you know, more restrictive is, is tends to be more secure but not as easy to work with. Okay. So you, you don't want to ignore the risk anything at, at all, for sure. You want to be able to make sure you're dealing with it. There's something also called risk appetite. The level of risk the organization is willing to accept. And that, I think that's kind of back to, you know, how much money you have and what you, you know, you have a risk level that you are taking on and deciding how much money you're going to spend to deal with these, these problems. Now, risk assessment. We do definitely need to go through a risk assessment and determine the risk level for our organization. And we got to think outside of the IT world. I mean, I think maybe a lot of us here are computer people so we're kind of thinking from the perspective of IT but I realize it's also the business the business is the main entity here and we're IT was brought into it to make the business run more effectively and we're the whole idea is to you know make sure the business succeeds to the best of our ability based on what we do and we want to do a good job there but it is about the business and your risk level when you do your risk assessment will change based on different time periods. I mean, it's a point in time evaluation, of course. So you got to just ask yourself when you think about when you do a risk assessment, it's not like you're necessarily evaluating the entire company in all their locations. There may be a restricted scope that you work with. And of course, we, we'd spell out the different types of assets. What are the threats? What are the vulnerabilities? The likelihood? The impact? And then put together a report that people will look through and try to prioritize of what's most critical to what's least critical. Now, you know, we do a risk assessment. Sometimes it is a hard sell because we're trying to predict the future. We really are. You know, it's, it's tough. So in Texas, I guess you guys have tornadoes. In some areas you have hurricanes and different things. That, but yet, I bet you have seasons that are pretty good and seasons that are really bad, just like in Florida. So sometimes it's really hard to predict the future, you know, what what's going to come your way or our way. So there's there's a lot to look at that. You have a lot to take in and you, know, you gather information from many sources and just quantifying qualitative items. I mean there's some things that are qualitative that you can't put hard numbers on but yet they're trying to kind of put some sort of figures on those to the best of our ability. But generally quantitative quantity is is numeric remember at some sort of usually it's money. If you really want to get down to it it's usually money. Okay, and the qualitative is usually more of a, uh, maybe you've done a survey before and it had like a low, medium, high, or low scale, and you had some sort of rating system, and that would be qualitative, because there are some things you just simply can't put hard numbers on, okay, there's no financial to put in there, and remember, uh, that's what it's all about, quantitative is numeric values, and uh, that's a lot of times, I think, the, the big selling point when you tell a business, based on your business impact analysis, how much money they're going to lose, they don't do anything about this particular threat. Uh, you're talking quantitative. But then, you know, qualitative could be opinion-based. You may have a rating system and you, know, you may make up these different scenarios and get people to give you their comments anonymously or not on what they think. Okay? So remember this, single, the, uh, the quantitative. We have some formulas. Let me look ahead. They're going to kind of break them out over a lot of time. But effectively with this, we have the, the most simplistic formula is a single loss expectancy. And that's where you effectively look at your asset value and you, you think of what's going to, to harm it. Let's see. Let's see. I'd like to do it a different way.
complicated. Okay, let's try it again. Are you guys still there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. It's just it's really weird how that web page isn't coming up. Single loss expectancy. <laughs> risky, I see risky and see if that comes up. I guess I'll just try to I just forget going out there and search. I don't know what's something's funny going on here, but at least you still have the connection, so I'll just forget about that idea and go another way. Okay. So remember, you know, you sort of look at the single loss expectancy, you, you could do the figure and of you know your asset value and exposure factor, how it was affected. And it may end up being a pretty large number. But the reality is, I guess we're more concerned about how often, how, what it's going to be on a per year basis. But it is all financial. Okay. So the single loss expectancy is a cost of a single incident, but maybe that incident hardly ever happens. Okay. So we are really consumed with the annualized rate of occurrence. In other words, how often does it happen per year? And that may be based on some historical things that we pull from. And then we finally put it together and we figure out the single loss expectancy times how often it happens per year, annualized rate of occurrence, or you know, ARO. And that gives us an idea of what we could potentially lose, which we know all this, the reason we're doing all this is to figure out if we can, is it cost effective to purchase certain countermeasures like firewalls and antivirus products, security products, and things like that. It's got to be cost effective. That's what they're into. They want to make sure it's cost effective. Now, real life, real life does anybody find that they actually uh, do SLE, ALE calculations? See, I'm just curious. Does anybody actually find in your workplace you do uh, SLE or ALE, annualized loss expectancy type calculations to figure out whether a countermeasure is actually cost effective? Of course, you can get out. Okay, so yeah, chat windows there. I find what people are running to, I mean, all the academic books, lots of them, well beyond model two, push this very same thing that this is a good idea. But at the same time, I don't get the feedback that it seems to be popular. Maybe we're doing this subconsciously, but we don't really think through the formulas so much. But we, we, we may be thinking about it. So anyway, but that, that's the intention anyway, is to do some calculations to figure whether it's cost effective. Okay. So, okay. So we're just trying, how much money can we spend on this? And stay, you know, and plus we've got to stay on a security budget. We know that. Remember the qualitative, there's no really hard numbers. So you get people together, you can come up with like this, what if this happens or what if that happens, and get your people that are in the know to say, kind of work through those and kind of rank them and, and you see what you come up with and then try to figure out countermeasures from that. But there's no actual numbers per se. You can even do this kind of an anonymous way. It's called Delphi. That way no one's pressured to agree, like you need to agree with me on this or something. There's no intimidation, so that's a good way to go. So really, you know, this qualitative analysis, it is it's really kind of pushes different methods of accomplishing this. You could have questionnaires, workshops, interviews, observe, you know, things. I mean, there's just a lot of ways. Okay? And remember the qualitative, you're not using numbers like, well, this is going to cost us $2 million. You're not doing that. It's more of, is it a lot, is it a high, a medium, or a low, maybe in likelihood determination? Or maybe we're looking at impact, high, medium, low, and we have some, we might translate into some numerics or something in some cases in our charts. And you can kind of put together a little grid here. Here they're referencing the NIST, the uh, special publication, 800-30, and there's a lot of uh, nice special publications dealing with risk risk analysis and things like that. And, you know, you could kind of just kind of look at the, the you know, what's the impact, what's the, the likelihood, and try to do some calculations that way. So, in the end, you end up with, you've done your risk assessment, you put together a report, and you do some recommendations, okay? Then response to risk, okay? We're trying to figure out what we're going to do to deal with what we've learned in our risk assessment report. Now, we have choices. 
and you know they're calling this you know mitigate risk. With this, you could say, well, I'm just going to get cyber security insurance or something. I'm going to transfer the risk to an insurance company, a third party, or I'm going to go buy that firewall. I'm going to go buy that security device, and I'm going to reduce my risk. Maybe I my buy some sort of full anti-malware product line. Or maybe I looked into it, and what it would cost me to buy the countermeasure is far more expensive than what I anticipate I could lose if this risk is realized. So I'll just live with it. I'll accept the risk. And it's not really irresponsible if you've looked into it. Now, to ignore the risk, which is not on a screen, that would be sloppy. That would be, well, if I don't see it, it doesn't exist, and I just will put my head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. That's ridiculous. So with this, um, you, if you're going to accept the risk, you've looked at it and said it's just not cost effective. Avoid the risk. Well, maybe you've decided uh, wireless is not, is not acceptable. You can't live with it. If you came to that conclusion, you could cease that activity that poses that unacceptable level of risk. So again, transfer it to an insurance company, put a control in place, which I usually think of that as mitigating, and then accepting or accepting the risk is not cost effective, so I'm going to live with what I have, and or avoid the risk and simply whatever I consider risky, such as we'll say wireless, don't do it anymore. So you know we have to kind of put this together and realize we'll never completely eliminate the risk, and there will be something left over called residual risk. I'm sure the residual risk is less than or equal to the acceptable risk. We've got kind of like a conceptual formula, total risk minus your controls you put in place. So you think about your big risks that you have. Then you put your countermeasures in place. You decide to get your firewall, your intrusion prevention system, and all these things in place. What, whatever risk you still have is called residual. Okay. So their big theory here is that it should always be cost effective. I mean, I'm not sure every company believes that. Uh, and, uh, companies probably believe that, I would think, but perhaps if we're talking about national security, it may not be a matter of cost. It may be a thinking of, well, you can't put a price on that. We must protect it. You know, that may be that mindset. But for the you know, perspective of testing on these type topics, they're not usually thinking from the military mindset, I don't believe. It seems more like a pure financial. Okay. So if the service were 3000 a countermeasure that costs 4000 wouldn't be used. That's, that's the thinking. Okay, and realize that when you think about countermeasures, it is simple enough to go, well, that countermeasure only costs this much to purchase, but then, oh gosh, there's maintenance fees, and there's, people have to learn, you know, man hours to maintain, like I just bought a graphics program, it was only $50, but gosh, I'm going to learn it, so <laughs> it's going to take a while to get used to it. Negative effects on the production environment, it could slow things down. You know, something, something we do is now super secure, but it's slowing things down, so it does kind of add to those costs. Okay. And with risk monitoring, and we start talking about, you know, SDLC can stand for a couple different things. Software, system development, life cycle. I mean, we should think about risk throughout any sort of process that we go through and any sort of changes we make and so on. And we need to adjust and realize it's, a, it's a, not a static environment, that things are changing. Absolutely. Okay, any questions before we do a quick little review of security management? Okay, are you guys doing okay? You can use the chat window or speak up either one. It's okay, so make sure you're still there. So quiet. Yeah, I just figured this would be probably a neat review, and we'll, of course, next time I'm with you, we'll keep continuing on those questions, but you know, this is probably just a good way to go back through this and refresh your memory, see if I can get through all this quickly. So security management is the second chapter. And we know that the security is very, very important. Security protection against danger, damage, loss, or crime. And, you know, and people have different perceptions of what is secure. And you could talk to, you know, different types of people. And they may have a complete different mindset on how things are. Remember the core of security, CIA. Confidentiality, integrity, availability, and with that, you know, you want to keep things confidential. You don't want people to see certain information because it's private, and you probably encrypted to protect it as well as permissions. And then the integrity, 
you know, we want to make sure that the information is accurate. And with that, we have, you know, hashing algorithms to verify if something has been manipulated. And availability is critical, too. We want the systems to be up and functional. Okay. So, you know, different businesses have different requirements. And it's absolutely true. You know, as I said, in the military environment, they're, they're kind of on the strict side. <laughs> But then some environments may be a, a good bit looser. You know, it needs to go along with what the business is you know, trying to, to do. They're talking about setting up a, a security program. I mean, yes, you do need senior management support, absolutely, because they're, they're a driving force. They have the money. You know, they have the authority. It kind of goes on and on. And there are actually a lot of standards out there to get some uh, reference to some more guidance from. There's an ISO 27002. Uh, it's a security framework, information technology, security techniques. And of course, um, I'm kind of moving on from that. So we need a security program. And, and maybe years ago we weren't thinking about it, but nowadays we really do. Okay. And it needs to be, you know, sometimes we're forced into it. And I think in a way that's nice for certain companies. I mean, I'm kind of somewhat glad that they're, in my opinion only, that HIPAA came out. Because at least it's kind of forcing... You know, the medical side to protect our records better than maybe they would have chosen to otherwise if it was given as choice. But, you know, because it's an easy way out just to simply say, well, I'm not going to spend the money. We'll take our chances. But that is sensitive information here. So we've got to have security, uh, you know, foundation, administrative, technical, and physical. We'll see to go through. Um, they call this the planning horizon. And with this, as you look through this, I mean, you may have your day-to-day -day activities that you're, are your tasks that you do that might be your so-called operational goals just to get through the day. <laughs> but then you may have goals that are a little bit further out midterm. And you might have goals in the very end or ultimate goal that we are new, doing operational tactical to get toward. And here they're suggesting that maybe our ultimate goal, strategic, was a full security program. But maybe along the way, we did a tactical. We carried out risk analysis on the company. And daily, we did operational, keeping the production environment up and running. Maybe that was hard enough to, to do. So strategic is the long term, and then you know, operational, daily, tactical, midterm, and so on. And you know, in management, they may have a kind of an interesting perspective. I mean, they expect it all work and simple. They may assume that security is actually built into it, and that you bought the product. What else do you need to do? I got gotcha, you, firewall, what's your problem? You know, no, <laughs> yes, we have a firewall. Yes, we have an intrusion prevention system, but maybe it's not fine-tuned yet. Maybe it's not configured right. Now, we want the business to succeed, and, and maybe we're security obsessed, and then we don't want to do anything that interferes with functionality, though. Security should not get in the way of productivity. We, we want the security. But if we've gotten so strict that they can't get anything done, we probably did, didn't do a good job there. Okay, components of enterprise security. I mean, with anything, I mean, there may be some standards and such we have to follow, and uh, there may be some compliance and things like that. Kind of move it on. Here's your main controls as a refresher. Hopefully, this is a good refresher for you. Administrative, technical, and physical controls. Now, if we double check, I will kind of go in through these controls as we go through this. But when you look at this first picture, remember the computer people are probably, probably living in the technical control world. Although, you know, we do some physical as well. But physical is kind of obvious. You know, things we might do to lock a door, for example, put locks on a gate. Those are physical controls. But administrative does not mean like the computer administrator. I've heard people get confused like that. Think of more of management, human resources, people-oriented. That's probably more the administrative. So management responsibilities necessary to protect the assets. Okay. So here you are, more details. Administrative is like you know, higher ups. Deal with policies, procedures, standards, and guidelines, which are recommendation. Deal with your employee, make test, do tests and drills on certain activities, do your risk management and analysis, classify your data if necessary, security awareness training. Then you think of the uh, technical, sometimes called logical controls. This is more of like, I guess, when I think of a computer security administrator type, this, this feels right. Because we're, start, we're talking firewalls, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, maybe encrypting whole hard drives, 
or doing uh, encryption based on the file or folder level, the protocols we choose, choosing secure shell over telnet, you know, something like that. You know, all these things we do. Uh, then the physical, those kind of just jump out. Yep, the door is locked. The window is a really strong window. <laughs> Good thick walls. Couldn't kick through those, perhaps. Security guards that are armed. Vicious dogs. Fencing. I've seen some fencing at certain places. It looks like it's at least 12 feet high with barbed wire bar going both directions. Adequate lighting makes it safer. Locks that are pretty secure, not just your standard combination lock. Uh, maybe someone tries to break into an area, an intrusion detection system detects that they tried to break in. So we're all like, you know, working on getting more and more secure. Okay. The thinking is though, anything you develop needs to be measurable. Okay. So your security program is not really a security program if you can't measure if it's actually successful. So you know, that's just kind of what they're pushing here, and regulations could change the way you do things too. So report to management, everything goes back to management. Audit and compliance reviews, yes, if you're being held by a certain standard, you could be audited. You've got to have the financial to make this work. Okay. Senior management, you know, I know that one question a day was harder because the, in, the instinct was to choose senior management. But I guess if you look at the big picture, we really need everybody on board when it comes to security. But absolutely, senior management is, is a big part. And they define the scope, objective, priorities, and so on. They they give us the funding. <laughs> you see them pushing. If we have an idea and they're going along with that, it tends to be more successful. They're ultimately accountable. Without management support, security efforts are doomed from the beginning. That's the rationale. Okay, we want them on board. And of course, we don't want to, as a company, be found negligent either. And with this, we want to. There's all kinds of different definitions of some of this, but. I'm going to pick on due care and due diligence from a different perspective. Um, you know, you might do your due diligence. I've seen due diligence defined even another way, where you, maybe you're doing your vulnerability assessment, and instead of a follow-up, maybe it's like a pre-part, where you, you do your research, you do your vulnerability assessment to see if there's any uh, weaknesses that we have. And then it, with the, once we've done our vulnerability assessment, then we take action to do something about it. We could have exercised our due care. That would be another definition. But we do want to show that we were, we tried to act responsibly and do what we, a reasonable person could do and avoid liability. Now remember these definitions. You have the uh, data owner, and they're responsible for the data and the data classification because it's their data. Okay? And then you've got the computer system, you might think of that way. The system owner, responsible for specific computer systems. So you could have one computer system, we said so we'll have one system owner that can hold data from several data owners because my one big computer might be my computer, I'm the system owner, but then I might have data from different people, so different data owners. Or maybe I'm responsible for a maintenance task and I'm the data custodian. Or maybe I'm just a, a user and I just routinely use the company data for work-related tasks because that's my job. Okay. And, you know, people have different functions and everything. You have some people that do auditing to make sure things are being done proper, whether it be based on regulations or internal, external, and things like that, and so on. So, you know, we, we need a security program. I think you're kind of getting that idea. And we, we think, uh, you know, these are all big parts of it, policy standards, procedures, guidelines, and so on. So moving on to policy. We want everything to be approved by senior management. They, we have to have a good line of communication, I would say, to senior management, absolutely. And throughout the company, for that matter. Maybe integrated with human resources and, and other corporate management policies, that's okay. So really, I mean, there's a lot happening when we start looking at some of these. I mean, I would say guidelines tend to be the only optional one here. If we put together certain standards or certain procedures or certain baselines, I mean, they're expected to be followed. But guidelines, again, are more recommendations. Okay. So when you think about a policy, I've always heard that being called high level, actually. I mean, we, don't hope, we hope the policy doesn't change that much. But you don't want to put anything in the policy that's like against the law, you know, especially something against your employees that you just did. You put in there you thought was reasonable, but it wasn't. So it's good to have access to the legal department and find out, make sure everything you put in policy is good. But, you know, you're kind of just doing high level at that point. And 
policies are not etched in stone that they're a forever thing. Okay. There could be certain things in the policy that you make changes to. And you know, you kind of taking you look at some of these different terms again, just remember the guidelines are the optionals and you know, you may have a baseline of how things should be set, and you may have certain standards on your system that everybody must follow this standard. And you might even have systems that will, a software that will evaluate if they are compliant and whether they get to stay on the network. And just remember, I would say with the pol right back to the policies, though, those are the high level and the procedures are the step by step that you do. The human resources, I mean, you may be a computer person that wish you could get rid of the users, but uh, they're here at the moment, and there, there, there's people that are that take you know, HR deals with the people factor more so, and you know computers don't run themselves; they need users to do so. So, and the human resources would go through a process of you know steps they go through when they hire somebody, and then maybe maintaining and watching, and making sure people are doing a good job you're watching them and finally maybe with some particulars you do when you terminate these people and perhaps you escort them out of the building and, and uh, don't let them touch a computer on their way out so and so the security awareness training is such a big one remember weakest link is your people you know that was just a question that came at one of my classes they said because you know I refer to the military a lot and they said if the military is so secure how come we keep hearing about breaches I speculate it's some employees <laughs> it's the people because that's an unpredictable thing. People can be manipulated sometimes. People can be, hey, I'll give you lots of money, you do this. You show me that top secret information, whatever it may be. So we have to have proper management, good communication, and so on. Except we use policy. Policies are supposed to be followed. They're not just nice to look at on paper. Okay. It really is a good idea to check out people before you hire them. You don't want to hire somebody that's got Maybe perhaps you don't want to hire someone to say it's an absolute. Maybe you don't want to hire people that have a felony record of some sort. Um, perhaps that's your you know, policy and everything, then that might be something you check into. That you know, at least or at least inquire before you do and make you know, find out what that was about. If you are going to hire them, find out if it's you know might be something they did very stupidly in their youth. I ran into a student like that and he was so brilliant, but he made made a stupid decision when he was young and had to go to jail for a long time and you know some companies aren't going to hire him flat out. This pre-employment test they're going to check him out and go this guy's got a felony he is not coming here we don't care how smart he is. And he did this when he was you know young and something kind of down there. But uh, yeah and then when you have people leave you know they could come back and they may be upset that you just fired them and they could plant something on your system and harm you so you may have a policy that says I will escort them out and lock, it will go ahead and um, disable their account, something like that. So yeah, and what about these others? I mean, these are just some interesting ones. I mean, some companies are very concerned about your credit history, and if they say if you have good credit, maybe you're more dependable than if you don't. Or, you know, let's say you talk to them, find out maybe it was due to um, health issues, and you owe the hospital's money, and it wasn't so much irresponsible because you've had health problems. Uh, drug screening. Maybe um, we find out that you know, you're actively using some drugs that are unacceptable. And did you really go to Harvard? Did you really have those years of education and experience and you know, on and on? Things that we do. And of course, you have the exit interview. There's certain things that your people have learned about that are it's not supposed to be told to others, non-disclosure. So perhaps you've been, uh, seen that done in a company before where they immediately escort you out of the facility or someone You've seen that done too, okay? Give it up all your access, disabling the account. Probably would disable it, and not re remove it, because you may need access to that account. Change your password. And sometimes it's hard to tell if it's really an unfriendly termination, truly. And it's good to spell out what a job function is supposed to be, and it's great if you can cross train people so they know more than just their one job. And then when you rotate them around, that can actually be helpful as well with the cross training potentially and maybe less fraudulent type behavior because they're not so comfortable in their new location. And then maybe the people, they don't know if they would tell them if they were after something, doing something fraudulent. Mandatory vacation make you leave for a while, a week or two weeks a year so we can follow up on you. 
And, you know, we think about the different types of training. I mean, the security awareness training is big. You know, you have your general job training, and we have professional training we get along the way. Whatever training you do, do think about who you're training. If you're training the manager, to say, doing some sort of security training to the managers, you may speak one way to them. Versus if you do security training to the technical staff, you're going to talk to them, you know, probably a little more in depth. So make sure it makes sense. You don't want to just sound super intelligent and, and say a lot of large in-depth words that they're going, I didn't catch any of that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really do a whole lot of good if they don't comprehend.